So, uh, hello everyone. In my language, I introduce myself. My name is Kelsey Leonard. Um, I'm from the Shinnecock Nation. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about my territory in a minute. Um, but I also just wanted to give thanks to the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, the Métis, and the Wendat peoples um, whose land we are, are able to gather on today. I'm a visitor to this part of the world, um, so I, I ask humbly to, uh, for them and for their ancestors to allow me to be here to speak and to share these words with you. Um, my talk is titled Walking for the Water, Indigenous Water Governance and the Resurgence of Water as Kin. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot today about water from an indigenous perspective um, and specifically from uh, what indigenous uh, elders and leaders, uh, the grandmothers, um, elders have called the, and in my language, the Wotoomen uh, Ogi, or the heart of Mother Earth, which we now know as the Great Lakes. So it's, uh, it's customary from the teachings that have been shared with me doing this work here in the Great Lakes uh, to open uh, with song because water can hear, uh, water has memory, and water listens. Um, and so in that same way, I've been instructed to, to have water here in a copper vessel so that the, our minds coming together to learn today can also be shared with the water because the water connects us all around the world. Uh, so this song uh, is prepared um, by Turtle Lodge. Um, they, they put this song out there, Nishinaabe Kwe uh, Nibi song, so a water song, a song for the water. Hopefully it'll play. Yeah. 
with that water song. There are quite a few uh, water songs, especially if you are um, an indigenous community that identifies as a water people. Um, so for the water walkers, you may have heard different versions of Nabi songs. Um, this is one. I like that uh, this song in particular. Let's see if I can exit out of this. There we go. I like this song in particular because it showcases how the water connects us all in terms of our hydrologic cycle. Uh, it talks about the thunder beings and, and the storms and how that comes into our existence and understanding of water and connection to water. It thanks Grandmother Moon um, because she controls the tides and the way in which the, the, the tides come in and greet us and leave us um, day in and day out. And, and it goes through and it gives thanks for all these ways in which water greets us um, and connects us together. Um, um, so it's, it's a very powerful song and I think it speaks to some of the, the philosophy and the worldview behind which uh, the spiritual connotation of our understandings of water and our kinship to water come into existence. Uh, so that speaks to, to my kinship. How do I find myself here? How do I find myself uh, speaking to you all today? Um, I come from the Shinnecock Nation. Uh, our territory is that portion, um, they're currently in purple, but originally it would have been all of this eastern end and southern shores of what we call Pominock. Um, it's what you currently know as Long Island, New York. Um, but, and that purple area is our current uh, reserve uh, where my family lives, um, an extended family, and uh, where I spent a, a bit of my youth as well. And the interesting part about our territory is it's where fresh water meets salt water. Um, and I think that that's been very foundational in the establishment of my career and in my research um, and in the protection and advocacy that I strive for for our indigenous uh, lands and waters as, as a global indigenous people. Um, it's to be able to understand that connection to water, that it's not by bifurcated by um, what may commonly be known as salt or fresh, but that it's actually where we meet, um, that that uh, duality allows us to exist. Um, the other thing that we are known for traditionally is being whalers. Uh, we um, are some of the most preeminent whale men from whale men and whale women from uh, the turn of the uh, 20th century, um, but going prior to, to contact. Um, we have a spiritual connection to whales uh, that maintains itself to this day. Uh, but one thing that you might be more familiar with in terms of um, my people, um, or Shinnecock translates to people of the shore, um, sometimes we're known as the people that, that stayed behind. And I like to say that I think that's because we knew the power of the ocean, we knew the power of that shoreland and that it was important to protect that while others migrated um, east, uh, west, um, and potentially north as well. But one of the things that comes from our waters is the quahog shell. Um, that shell is what's used to carve wampum beads that have created the wampum belts for this part of the world. 
Um, it has to come from the Atlantic Ocean, and particularly in estuary and bays where fresh water meets salt water to enable that habitat, um, that uh, northern hardshell clam to grow. Um, that to me is a bit of how I see my trajectory as a scholar and as an advocate. Uh, coming to this part of the world, it's like a wampum bead that's been fashioned out of a clamshell. Coming from the Atlantic Ocean here to understand our diplomacy as indigenous nations in our modern society um, and how that bead um, in its fashioning can constitute our political understandings going forward. So all of that being said, um, there's a few things that led me to what I'm going to share with you today about water and kinship, um, a big part of it was uh, a call to action that was put out um, by grandmother Josephine Mendamin and Joanne Robertson to um, count how many walks have happened since she started. And um, for those of you that don't know, grandmother Josephine passed away about a week or so ago. Um, she was put to rest, um, but she told us to keep doing the work. So one thing that is important with this is um, for some of our teachings, and for some folks' teachings, I want to be respectful of that, uh, to not share photos or not say her name, but she did say that she wanted us to do the work, and a part of doing the work is saying her name and sharing her story and sharing the pictures of all the work that um, she did along with others by her side. So I ask you humbly to, um, uh, to forgive me if in any way what you see today may be offensive in, in that nature and in your own healing and understanding if you did know Grandmother Mandaman. So before we get to any of that and to understanding our kinship, um, we have to understand a bit how it was severed. And I want to share something with you. So it's called, We Do Not Consent. She woke up to excruciating pain, every part of her ached and throbbed. She looked down and could feel the injection lines, pumping her into submission. Unable to escape, she had been stripped until barren. Her green skirt ripped from her body. There were fresh bruises and cuts atop old scars. She lay naked and exposed in darkness as water flowed down. But in this darkness, what scared her most was that she was alone. She had always had her ancestors around her. She called out for them. Searching around her, she realized they too had been taken from her, excised from her existence, ripped from the ground beneath her. How could this happen to her? Would anyone believe her? They'd say she was too welcoming. She was too kind. She shouldn't have flaunted her beauty so much. That's what they say. Her generosity is weakness. Her beauty, not her own. She is property. But from the depths of her despair and the pillaging of her beauty, we will rise. We will stand for her, her indigenous children that call her mother. We are still here. We do not consent. So in an era of Me Too, cartoons like this started to emerge. Me Too, says Mother Earth. 67 environmental regulations to be reversed under the Trump administration. Similarly, things have happened here under the Ford administration. Reversals and ignorance that damage indigenous livelihoods, lands, territories, waters, and in fact, all livelihoods, lands, territories, waters. But let's take a look at consent. What does consent actually mean? A concurrence of wills voluntarily yielding the will to the proposition of another. Agreement, approval, permission. Consent is an act of reason, accompanied with deliberation, the mind weighing as in a balance the good or evil on each side. Submission under the influence of fear or terror cannot amount to real consent. As indigenous nations, 
we do not consent. We have not consented to the activities that have occurred in the Great Lakes since the establishment of the Boundary Waters Treaty in 1909, where we were not signatories or parties to negotiations. This map shows you over 97 indigenous nations that have occupied territories within the Great Lakes drainage basin. That doesn't account for the indigenous nations that are forcibly removed but have ancestral ties to this land and these waters. And if you take into account that number, it grows exponentially to over 200 indigenous nations, both on the imagined border, on the, both on the sides of the imagined border of Canada and the United States. So I turn to you. If you lived in a country where one out of every six people you met had drinking water too polluted for human consumption, what country would you be in? Thoughts? Can shout out names. Yes? India. India? Okay. Potentially. Anyone else? What we like to call here Indian country or Turtle Island. Um, one out of every six people of our nations are facing a water security crisis. This is, it's important to know that because that's also what inspired Grandmother Mandaman to start walking for the water. Um, she is, um, she is, she was, she is always. Um, a part of the Three Fires Confederacy um, and the, the Three Fires Lodge for the Medewin Society. Um, that definitely informed a lot of her work, um, a lot of her understanding and philosophy around why the water should be protected. Um, she was inspired um, by one of the lodge leaders uh, pro prophesizing that in 30 years, this was in 2001, so by 2030, um, an ounce of water would cost as much as an ounce of gold. Um, and in that lodge teaching and in that sharing of that prophecy, uh, they were asked, so what are you going to do about it? And so she took the time to start to think about what could she do? What could she do to protect the water, to change this prophecy that water would co cost as much of an, as an ounce of gold in 2030? And so after a long amount of deliberation and working with other, other women and other elders from her lodge and from her community um, of, of Wakwemakon and other Anishinaabe nations um, around the Great Lakes, she decided that she was going to walk for the water in ceremony. Um, and they started that walk in 2003 and the first walk occurred along Lake Superior. Um, she, uh, in her lifetime, walked all of the Great Lakes, over 32,000 kilometers, I think was the, the final marking. Um, and she walked all of the Great Lakes and some of them more than once. Um, and in addition to that, she uh, walked the entirety of the drainage basin. So she walked all of the lakes and then along the St. Lawrence out to the coast, uh, the eastern portion. Um, she also did the Four Directions Walk and was a part of that. So she walked a lot for the water um, and understood that the water connects us all, and it's not just, uh, there's, a, there's a, um, a spiritual connection that many of the nations and, in fact, indigenous peoples throughout Turtle Island have to the Great Lakes because they do see it um, and see them as the, as the heart of Mother Earth. Um, and so I think she really embodied that in what she put forward for the values of, of water walking. Um, but she wasn't alone, and she says that all the time. Um, uh, she was a part of, a, of many, many women and men and, and, and non-gender conforming peoples who um, were inspired um, by the prophecy to take up this work and to um, conduct themselves in a prayerful manner. So I wanted to share with you two of the walks that are very, um, two of the walk in, water walk institutions, we might call them, that are very inspiring. So Mother Earth Water Walkers, that is uh, sort of the, the water walker network um, that Grandmother Josephine Mandamin uh, created along with others and Joanne Robertson was very instrumental. She's the author of the Water Walker book. Um, very instrumental in, in sort of helping to be an organizer of that institution. Um, it predominantly sort of centered with folks that um, 
you may see as being a part of the, or I guess on the imagined line of, on the Canadian side. And then on the, if we consider the imagined line on the American side, we have the um, Nibewaks, which are led by Sharon Day, as well as others, but I, I would say she, she's definitely a figurehead for the Nibewaks. But there are so many more. Um, there are the, the, there's a group of indigenous people from uh, the Peterborough era, um, area, um, that have done walks since 2011. Um, there are water walkers all around the world. And so in doing this work and the charge that uh, grandmother put to us and a few others that have been working on this project, we've counted almost 120 walks that have been held since 2003 around the world. Um, and other locations out around the world include um, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, as well as in Belgium, uh, Japan, um, and, and other places. And so I think one of the really important things to take away from understanding what are the walks, they manifest themselves in so many different ways. Sometimes they're a physical walk, Sometimes there are a ceremony that is at a site of water. Um, but I think the biggest takeaway for what are they, it's the embodiment of reconnecting through that kinship to be like water. Um, and you'll hear that, um, uh, well, Grandmother Josephine would say that a lot. Sharon Day d still says that, um, that the purpose is to be like water. Um, but I think we wanted to delve a little bit deeper in talking with, with grandmother and with Joanne. We wanted to get a better idea of why people walk for the water. Is it to be like water or is there, is there another reason that they're inspired to take up this work and to take up this, um, th these types of prayers? And so we created a water walker survey that I'm going to share with you a bit of some of our findings from that survey today. Uh, we had about 100 participants that uh, took the survey. Um, there are thousands of water walkers around the world and they're very busy people, but we're, we are excited to have sort of this snapshot uh, from them of a hundred different walkers from around the world who, um, who gave us their insights and their teachings as to why they do this, uh, do this work. Um, so for the water walker survey, um, one of the things I wanted to, to share with you is whether or not uh, the water walkers are indigenous. Sometimes people think that um, it's only an indigenous uh, activity. And it was really interesting because uh, um, grandmother and others that I've spoken with over the past few years, they, they often say that when they first start out on the walks, um, non-indigenous folks would come up to them and like would be really unsure first what are you doing and then second can I like once they heard what they were doing about praying for the water and trying to make sure that it's protected and that we fulfill our responsibilities as human beings on this planet they were like wow that's so cool can I participate they were always so apprehensive that it was something that they couldn't be a part of um, and for the folks that we we've spoken with and that we interviewed they were like no this is open to everyone if you're a human on this planet, you're made up of water, then this water walks are for you. Um, and so when we took the survey, we actually had obviously more indigenous folks participating, but a fair amount of non-indigenous folks that also shared their insights. So um, when you look at some of the responses, it's important to consider that. Now, the other thing we've had asked of us is, is are water walks just for women? And there's this uh, kind of a, a gendered understanding of indigenous relations to water. Um, but some of those understandings, we weren't really sure if they were coming from indigenous peoples or if they were being sort of placed on us, a part of the sort of colonial structure, the settler colonial states understanding of the binary. And so when we sort of had survey participants we had quite a lot more female participants than male, um, but we also had folks that were non-gender conforming or a third gender, um, because in a lot of our indigenous nations, we, we don't exist on the binary of male and female. So we wanted to be open to that. I'll speak to this a bit more in terms of how gender comes into our understanding of water walks, um, but what we also found in doing the survey is that we also needed to reach more males um, who were participating, and so we did that through um, some story sharing through interviews that I'll share with you later. So um, one of the things that was a really key takeaway was we were also trying to see if the water walks really were because of Grandmother Josephine or if people were doing them original teachings. Um, so for the participants that, that uh, 
took the survey, um, most of them, so close to 90%, did say that they were inspired by Josephine. Um, but some of them, there was still a good portion that said no, they, they, they weren't really sure who, who, that, who that is, or maybe no, they had their own teachings or, or visions that had come to them to inspire them to do this prayerful um, uh, work. And so, but overall, we did see that um, Josephine did inspire a lot of the participants. And so, um, thinking about that, thinking about, but when, when she is asked, or when she was asked about this, she often said, well, it's, it's a part of our original teachings, at least for the, uh, for the Midday, and then um, for largely um, related to Anishinaabek uh, peoples. Um, but then for some of the Haudenosaunee folks that we also interviewed, and Métis folks that were a part of this, um, they also said that it resonates because it's a part of our teachings, and it's, it's a new way of reconstituting that old kinship. Um, and so when we think about that kinship to water, uh, they really felt that the water walks were, were an old way that was being reclaimed. Um, inspired by Josephine. So um, one of the other things was how many water walks have people participated in? Uh, we found um, that majority of people had done one to two, um, but then it jumped, right? It really went to, if you had done one to two, then you slowly got to be, some of the participants in the survey were, uh, had done five or 10 or more than 10. And we really started to see too that there are a core group of water walkers that have participated in almost everyone that Josephine has led or that Sharon has led. It really is part of a community that's been constituted to protect the water. Um, the other thing we noticed is once people had participated in a water walk, they were extremely likely, uh, when, they asked if, when asked if they were likely to participate in a water walk again, m a majority of respondents said ex that they were extremely likely to do it again. So that number uh, keeps increasing after that first participation. Uh, and that was corroborated as well by some of the interviews that we did. So you're probably asking yourselves, well, why protect the Great Lakes? Why do they feel inspired to, to do this work? Um, one of the things that I often hear from folks is a, n a negative connotation related to indigenous people when we talk about how the Great Lakes are threatened. Oh, they're just, they're just, that's those natives being activists. They're just trying to, you know, start something, riot, whatever. Um, and when I hear that, it's totally discounting all of the stories and knowledge that people are sharing on the ground, grassroots folks are sharing about the threats to the Great Lakes and the threats to the waters around them. And so a big charge in this research for me was to say, okay, well, how can we corroborate a lot of the things that are being said by um, respondents in the survey and by um, uh, participants in the interviews? So. Firstly, um, we had, uh, this is data from the second binational poll of the International Joint Commission um, for the Great Lakes Water Quality Board. Um, they, uh, this is the second time doing this poll. They did it in 2015, and now uh, this poll has been redone in 2018. Um, it's the first time it actually includes indigenous, um, an indigenous sampling, a representative sampling of indigenous peoples, um, those that self-identify as um, First Nation, uh, Tribal Nation, or Métis. Um, and and one of the key findings here is for indigenous uh, people when asked why they uh, think the Great Lakes should be protected, one of the key um, defenses or reasons was for, for the fish, um, to be able to protect um, the ecosystem, to be able to uh, stop the increase of development specifically around pipelines and oil infrastructure and also to protect for future generations. Now this in, the, in contrast to non-indigenous people who were polled, um, they found they wanted to protect their drinking water, they wanted to protect the water as a valuable resource, so there's an economic valuation that's placed onto water, um, and surprisingly or unsurprisingly, almost 20% of non-indigenous respondents in this poll didn't have a reason to protect the lakes. They said, I don't know. So when we think about what indigenous people are facing and why we're walking for the water, um, it's to protect the fish, it's to protect the ecosystem, it's to ensure that these waters and lands are, are able to be passed down to future generations to maintain our cultural, political, and socioeconomic existence as nations in perpetuity. Um, but oftentimes when we say there's something wrong with the water, there's something wrong with the land, we know there's something wrong, but no one 
believes are indigenous um, voices when they are when they're shouting these uh, these claims. Um, so I did some some additional research. Um, to try and corroborate this visually, and this is what you're seeing here. Um, areas of concern are areas within the Great Lakes Drainage Basin that the International Joint Commission and the parties of the International Joint Commission, which are the United States um, and Canada, have agreed are highly contaminated sites that have been impaired for beneficial use by humans. Um, there are uh, you can see from the blue squares here, as well as the um, orange triangles and red dots, these are all of the areas of concern, these highly contaminated sites in the Great Lakes Basin that um, Canada and the United States have designated. More than 50% of indigenous nations in the basin live within 50 kilometers of one of those highly contaminated sites. One third live within 10 kilometers. That is a crisis of environmental justice. It is a grave environmental injustice that indigenous nations have to deal with water that is contaminated at these high levels. So these, this corroborates what water walkers are saying and why they believe that the water must be protected, the water needs prayer, the water needs us as humanity to reconstitute that kinship, to reconstitute um, our, our understanding of our roles and responsibilities as humans. Um, but one thing they will constantly say, and I think this is really key, um, we're not protesters, especially because water walks often, it's about you walk, as, you walk as in close proximity to the water as you can, because you're trying to build that relationship, you're trying to build that connection, that kinship. Um, and so sometimes it often occurs along roads, because we put roads near water a lot of times, um, and so people see natives on the road and they're like, oh, they must be protesting, they must be putting up a blockade. These are the stereotypes types that have just kind of filtered into the public's imagination over the years and are a part of the colonial mindset of detracting from indigenous voices and indigenous understandings of what is good governance. Um, so to label us as protesters negates our values, negates what we're trying to say. Um, but it also just, it's not factual. There's no truth to it. So for the water walkers, they're not protesters. Um, in the interviews, what they have said is that um, this is a part of a prayerful action. This is about prayer. It's about ceremony. Um, it's about being able to reclaim traditional teachings. Um, it's also about indigenous knowledge exchange. So, um, so much has been taken from us over the years that for many, the water walks are an opportunity to, among indigenous people and non-indigenous people, to exchange that knowledge and to rebuild that knowledge that was stolen from us. Um, and it's also sharing and learning by doing. When we think about indigenous pedagogy, how we teach our young ones values and the, and the way in which they should be in the world, it's often by doing, it's not talking at them. And so for the water walks, that's a really important way that we enact that and embody that. Um, Another key finding from this work is that colonialism has disenfranchised us as indigenous women. Um, it's done that through the residential schools, through Indian boarding schools, through the domestication of us as women, um, the, the policies of domesticity teaching us that our role and our place is only in the house and as subjugated by property and by uh, a male counterpart. Um, that has severed, for many of us, that's severed ties to land and to water. Um, the Indian Act the in, uh, on the Canadian side, the Indian Reorganization Act instituted by the United States, policies of termination, 60s scoop, as well as adoption and stolen generations. These are the ways in which our connection and our kinship to water have been severed through the process of colonialism. And that colonialism hasn't ended. Part of this is also understanding that legacy and, and the trauma of that legacy. So um, an elder uh, previously said in talking about our connection to the environment, our connection to, to land and water, that one act of violence takes four generations to heal. And if you think about the acts of violence that have been committed against indigenous peoples, our lands, our territories, they're still ongoing. 
We need four generations to heal and no one's actually given us the time to do that. And so we're constantly being put in this position of, of defense and of having to um, restore our bodies and our communities uh, to, from this historical trauma, whether you call it reconciliation or not. Um, indigenous water rights, when, we, when, we, when we're advocating for that, these aren't just about a Western notion of enough quantity and quality of water for uh, individual livelihood. It's about the protection of water as a sacred entity and constituting that kinship again. So <laughs> this is something that I like to call collective resilience or survivance. Um, Gerald Visner has called this survivance, which is uh, the ability of um, survival with resistance. But I like to say that um, we no longer need to be positioned as resisting the colonial state. We are already resilient in the face of the colonial state. Um, so I think a big part of this work is about how do we reclaim these traditions in spite of the colonial state continuing to you know, do as they do and maintain the status quo. Um, another finding from this work is about living in the colonial binary. So again, it's about how do we create and reconstitute indigenous water governance on our own terms and not within the structure of the, of the colonial state. And a part of that is this binary that exists within, uh, within Western societies, um, that there is only male and female. Um, some of that there's a, there's a mixed understanding of that from uh, the folks that have participated in this research. There are men's roles and women's roles from some people's perspectives. Uh, sometimes the ideas around skirt teachings, who can wear a ribbon skirt, who can hold an eagle staff, um, have been very complicated points of, um, of understanding and knowledge mobilization within the context of water walks. I turn to, to folks who, um, like Sharon Day and like Josephine, who they, wear, they would sometimes wear skirts and sometimes not, and they carried the staff when no one else was there to carry the staff. And what they said is that everyone has a role in, in protecting the water. Everyone has a role in walking for the water. Um, and it's about balance and how you manifest that is um, it's okay to come to a collective understanding of that and one's ideologies or teachings are not superior to another um, but it also is important to listen and to not be disrespectful um, and a lot of times that also comes down to who is organizing the walk and who is organizing the ceremony um, and being respectful of their teachings um, if their teachings don't necessarily align with yours then you can carry water too you can carry your own ceremony you can constitute that because the water can use as much prayers as possible um, and so that's a bit of, uh, of some of the findings around this context of, of the colonial binary. One thing though that did come out, and I don't necessarily know that this has to exist within our uh, sort of colonized understandings of gender, um, that there is a unique connection that um, women who are able to carry life do have, or that a human being that is able to carry life, um, because maybe technology will evolve at some point, but that, that ability to carry life, that connection of the womb and of water, um, and what is sort of a, a teaching known as water is our first medicine because in, you are carried in the womb and in that water for nine months, and it's the first medicine that nourishes you before you come out into the world and are introduced to other, other medicines that that is very integral to how we understand uh, these ceremonies and our connection to water and building that kinship to water. And so, you know, one of the things that's really important with this and that um, a grandmother, Mary Lyons, she's also um, a Anishinaabe Kwe, she said, we all have that connection to water. It's not something that the water walkers just b build or that they achieve by participating in a water walk. You have it when you're the, at the moment that you are given life on this planet. What we do is we lose the connection. We lose that, that kinship. And we have to do a better job in educating our young ones and in our understanding of ourselves as humans on this planet to not lose that connection from birth. And so there are really great folks who are doing amazing work around that. Educators, teachers, who are trying to bring the teachings of the water walks into their classrooms. Uh, there's a movement right now called the Junior Water Walkers to make sure that our young ones don't lose that connection to water. That when they get, some, when they get water out of the tap, they know where it's coming from and it's not just some magical thing that emerges from metal. That there really is a connection that is maintained. 
So some motivations, you're probably asking yourselves, okay, well, so what did they say why, for why they walk? <coughs> some people said it was for justice. Some people said it was about spirituality and spiritual healing. This idea of protection, conserving, stewardship towards water, uh, restoring that connection. A lot of people mentioned that water is sacred, water is life. That connotation came up quite, quite frequently. Um, some people also wanted to bring awareness to the general public. They felt that the walks were a great way um, for the public to try to understand indigenous knowledge in action um, and not just in sort of the, the, the atmosphere. Um, because that's often a question that indigenous peoples get asked. Well, what do you mean by indigenous knowledge? What is indigenous science? Um, and for, for many folks, the, the walks were the embodiment of that, and they still are. Um, a restoration of balance. Sometimes uh, many folks felt that that the world was out of balance. That, um, and sometimes that, that balance had to do with gender. Um, they felt that, that we didn't understand our roles, or we had lost our way, or we didn't understand how to, how to exist in this, modern, um, in this modern era. And so participating in the walk, uh, kind of detecting for, for a bit, and just being conscious and present in the walks and in your prayers were a way to restore that balance. Um, Responsibility, so they felt like they, through their cultural teachings and upbringing, that participation in the walk was a responsibility that they had. They wanted to educate children or to educate their children, so there are a lot of, there's a lot of intergenerational aspects to the walks, young ones to old ones participating. Um, and then friendship and survival of all life, not just humans. Another uh, aspect and finding of this research is we wanted to ask the water walkers, the people who, who, who know how the water is threatened, what they believed good water governance looked like in, in the world and what it should look like. Because um, for the most part, we asked them, is the water being managed well? And majority of folks said, no, that's, that's partly why we're walking. Because if it was being managed well, then, um, then our prayers wouldn't be as fervently needed. We'd still need to be prayerful to maintain that, that kinship and that connection, but, um, but it wouldn't be as bad as it currently is. And so um, what they did say, in, in hoping for what we could strive for for good water governance in the future, there's a lot of people who um, advocated for the personhood of nature, for recognizing that nature has rights as a person, as a, as a living entity, was really how it was best put. Um, that we needed to have generational considerations um, for how we manage and make decisions about water, the future generations. Um, respect for indigenous sovereignty and self-determination, so indigenous nations um, weren't um, they felt weren't being consulted, weren't active in the decision-making process about um, uh, the waters of the Great Lakes. Um, they also felt that good water governance is collaborative, it involves citizens at all levels, it acknowledges that water is a human right. Um, indigenous peoples are really saying, we're not protesters, we're not terrorists, we just want clean water. We want the water to be protected. We want the water to be able to live um, and we, we need to be more like water um, in terms of our ability to forgive and to adapt and to not be so greedy. Um, and, and that also means that we have to come to um, reconciliation, if we'll use that term, with the way in which water colonialism is ongoing um, and the way in which we are complicit with it. That disenfranchises indigenous peoples, from our lands and territories. And so, you know, some of the images here, um, many of the water walkers reference Standing Rock. They were either there or participatory, participatory in the action to defend against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, but there are so many other types of actions that are happening around the globe. Um, this one is of the, for the Klamath River. These are Hoopa children who are um, advocating for the decommissioning of dams. Um, there was new data that was released yesterday by a, um, a global hydro project out of McGill University and other institutions um, that, have, that basically put this map out that shows all of the dam proliferation across the world. Um, highest concentration of dams in the world, do you know where it is? It's right here on Turtle Island. So if we think about the way in which water colonialism has severed our kinship as indigenous peoples, it's, because, it's, it's in large part due to this hydro proliferation, this proliferation of dams. And so we need to reconcile that before there can be any progress, before we can create a shared path and a shared future. 
So I also leave you with the fact that the future is bright and that the work will continue. Um, this is Autumn Peltier. Uh, she is Josephine's niece. Um, she is a water protector. She is a water ambassador. She spoke before the United Nations on World Water Day last year for the General Assembly. Um, and her message was, it's time for all of us to warrior up. And that's a big part of the water walks. We, the teaching is everyone has a role to fulfill. It, and, and the wonderful thing about the walks is many people thought, oh, I, I need to be able to physically walk to participate. And so many people participate in other ways. They fill their role, maybe they can't walk anymore. So they're the person monitoring the spot, or they're the person bringing food, or they're the car traveling behind to make sure that people are safe. Um, so I think when we, when we look at someone like, like Autumn and the message that she's sending, uh, and what Josephine has said to us is that this work will continue if we all take on the responsibility in what any, any what little way or any big way we can to fulfill our responsibilities to the water. So in thinking about messages that I leave you with about what is indigenous water governance, what is what are the water walks fulfilling? Um, they are an opportunity for us to speak for ourselves. They embody that. They are about respecting our rights to water, to territories, to self-determination. Oftentimes, the water walkers have to uh, climb fences and um, go over no trespassing signs because there is literally private property signs that cut off access to the water in so many places around the Great Lakes. Um, and so <coughs> that in and of itself is a violation of indigenous rights and our rights to self-determination. Our traditional territories and responsibility for stewardship also need to be recognized. Um, and we're seeing movement in that. Um, it, it, for, an in, for instance, in Hamilton, there's the Hamilton Water Walkers. Um, we held a, a joint meeting where they were able to uh, present alongside folks from the Hamilton um, Harbor uh, Port Authority Administration. And when they told them about how their Port Authority fences obstruct their ability to get to the water for ceremony, they didn't even realize that it was an issue. And so now they're collaboratively working together for the next water walk in Hamilton to um, fix some of those obstructions that have been uh, in the way of, of that water walk. Um, a big part of this, and it's what I started with you earlier today, is about consent, about free prior and informed consent. That is a right protected under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It is a part of international law. Um, Canada and the United States are not lawfully operating within this territory uh, because they do not have our consent. Indigenous epistemologies for caring for water also need to be respected and they're a part of how we govern. Um, meaningful nation-to-nation -nation decision making across geopolitical scales. So this is no long, this no longer can be a territory where it's just Canada and the U.S. operating um, in isolation. We are nations with a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, relationship, and our treaties constitute that um, and, and need to be respected. And lastly, that our knowledge, our understanding of what's threatening the water, is valuable, is real. It's not something being made up. Um, we're not imagining it, and the data actually shows that we are um, corroborated in our concerns. So, if you leave today with anything, I hope it's that you you understand that you have a role to play. Uh, this isn't just an indigenous struggle. Um, as citizens of, of the U.S. and Canada, you have a right of responsibility to fulfillment of the treaties um, and to the stewardship obligations on this land. Um, if you inherit that citizenship, you inherit that legacy of fulfillment of those treaties. Um, and if not, then I think you're, you're failing as a citizen of the country. So it's important for us to honor the treaties. And lastly, I hope that you take some time in the next month or two um, to think about how you honor the earth, how you restore that kinship with water and with other non, um, what you might see as um, non-human relations. Um, all of these other living entities that are part of how we uh, exist on this planet. Um, and, and how you're fulfilling your right of responsibility to honor the treaties and protect the water every day, and potentially not just on what we like to call Ogi uh, Earth Day. So, Tabuni, thank you, and uh, if you have questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. <laughs>